prayers uh, will be heard. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, open your Bibles to Mark chapter 7. That's where we're at. Lesson 5, Truth, Tradition, and Other Miracles. So in the first six chapters, the Apostle, uh, 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 excuse me, Mark, uh, has clearly established his case for the deity of Christ. Remember I said the book of Mark, it's right to the point. No, no dilly-dallying establishes what he wants to say in the very first verse of his first chapter. And basically so far, uh, it's not moving forward, uh, Charles. There we go, thank you very much. All right, so, so far he's shown that by his teaching, uh, Jesus uh, has claimed it to be the Messiah. He has uh, described uh, miracles done by Jesus that could only be performed by one having supernatural power. No one could do the things that Jesus did unless he was divine. And even in describing the reaction of the people, there is the suggestion that they, they were uh, impressed and they were believing the claims and believing the miracles, so there's momentum, you know, so far there's momentum. Mark also keeps us aware of the difficulties Jesus was encountering from various groups who witnessed these things, but they refused to accept or believe uh, what their eyes told them. They saw the miracles, they heard the teaching, but they resisted. They resisted the conclusion. Yes, was that a miracle? Yeah, that was a miracle. He couldn't, he was blind, now he can see. Yeah, that's a miracle. And uh, the teaching, you know, yeah, I hear what he's saying. Uh, he's saying he's the Messiah, yeah. I just don't want to accept the conclusion. And we do that sometimes, the truth's right in front of our eyes and we, we don't want to accept what the truth is actually saying to us. And that's what was happening to many of the Jews. Uh, some turned away. Some of them uh, decided to attack because they felt threatened. Now, there's also the sub story of Jesus and his apostles. You know, there's the main story, Jesus, the Messiah, you know, preaching, doing miracles. And then there's the, the, the sub story about Jesus and his apostles. And Mark goes back and forth between those. How Jesus was teaching and developing them as apostles and how he was shaping their faith and preparing them to uh, realize the truth of his mission. His biggest job at the beginning, uh, the biggest challenge was to get his own apostles to accept the truth and then to act on that truth. So in chapter seven and eight, we go back into this, this cycle of miracles and teachings as Jesus continues his ministry among the people. So one thing Jesus was uh, teaching his apostles was the very great difference between human religious traditions and the authoritative word of God. So many traditions had crept into the Jewish religions, you couldn't, you couldn't tell the difference between the, you know, the authoritative word of God, the things that God uh, demanded, commanded over here, and then there was so much additional stuff that had been added on, you couldn't tell you know, where the authority stopped and where the traditions started. And Jesus was trying to kind of make a difference between these uh, two things. The Pharisees had made a life's work out of creating and maintaining an intricate set of religious rules and traditions based on, but not authority, but, but, but without the authority of God's word, based on God's word, but did not have the authority of God's word. For example, the word said not to work. In other words, your regular job, you know, the Sabbath. Take a break, don't go to work. Uh, focus on your relationship with God. Uh, a day of rest from normal activity. Focus on spiritual matters. That, that's what the Sabbath was about. The Pharisees invented torturous rules to define what work was. You know, we couldn't just leave it alone at don't go to work. No, they defined what work was. So lighting a fire, that was work. Carrying more than one stick of wood, that was work. Walking 
further than so many paces from your home. That was work. And so they explained and monitored and punished those who broke the rules. A little bit like uh, the Muslim uh, morality police in Iran. You know, they're having, you know, in Iran, they're, they're having uh, riots and people are fine, you know, they're rising up. Why? Because uh, uh, apparently they, uh, the morality police uh, uh, managed to kill a young woman uh, who had been arrested for not wearing a hijab or, you know, the, the, the head covering or not wearing it properly. So they arrested her and they brought her in and she died in their custody. So people are now, they're fed up, they're rioting. Well, I'm, it's not exactly the same thing, but the same spirit was at work. You know, we had the, the Pharisees, the morality police, and they were enforcing the traditions, not the commandments, the traditions uh, that mostly they had, uh, had invented. So uh, chapter seven describes a conflict between Jesus, the apostles, and the Pharisees over these kinds of rules. All right, so let's dive in. Mark chapter seven, one and two, the Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered around. What's the difference between a Pharisee and a scribe? Anybody know? What's the similarity? Yeah, their work. The scribes and the Pharisees did the same work. They were, you know, they were, they were lawyers of the law, right? And these rules. Difference was the Pharisees made up a certain sect, a certain type. They were a certain type of scribe. All Pharisees were scribes, but not all scribes were Pharisees. You understand? So the scribes made up a, of a, they were made up of a special group of extremely zealous individuals to maintain the laws and the traditions, okay? So it says the Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered around him when they had come from Jerusalem and had seen that some of his disciples were eating their bread with impure hands, that is, unwashed. So get the scene. A religious delegation comes from Jerusalem to question Jesus about his teachings and his habits. You know, we're here from headquarters <laughs> you know, to find out what's going on. They questioned the morality of the apostles because they ate their food with unwashed hands or impure hands. The implication was that by extension, Jesus, their teacher, was also impure. If your disciples are impure, guess who else is impure? Well, you know, your leader's impure as well. And so their reason for this accusation was that they believed and taught that if a Jew came in contact with a Gentile, or if a Jew came in contact with something that was even touched by a Gentile, they would then be defiled or impure because when they touched their food or ate it, they would transfer the Gentile impurity into themselves, like bacteria. You know, we have the same feeling about bacteria. You know, you've been out, you've been shopping, you've touched food, you've touched cans, you've touched the doors, you've touched your car, blah, blah, blah. And you get home to put away your groceries. And then before you start making food, what do you normally do? Well, you wash your hands. You know, I'm washing off, you know, the bacteria, the dirt that I picked up. Well, they kind of, the Pharisees believed that you could pick up spiritual dirt, impurity, by touching something that had been touched by a non-Jew. Never mind touching a non-Jew, touching something that a non-Jew touched. Well, I mean, you know, how would you know? <laughs> Anyways, that was, the, that, was the, uh, that was the teaching. And of course, being impure meant you couldn't approach God in worship. You were ceremonially unclean. So therefore you had to go through a whole system of rituals, you know, in order to be clean again and thus be able to worship at the temple and, you know, be able to carry out your religious exercises. So that was the, there's the scene, okay. Verse three and four, for the Pharisees and all the Jews who do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing the traditions of the elders. 
And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. And there are many other such, uh, there are many other things which they have received in order to observe, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and copper pots and everything. And it wasn't just washing them, it was the way that they washed. You know, it was you know, almost if you've ever seen a movie where a surgeon is washing, he just doesn't, you know, rinse his hands under, under the tap, right? He, 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 he cleans each finger and you know, they walk around like this uh, to get, well, it was a little bit like this. Uh, it was a very uh, uh, involved way of, of, of washing in order to be considered uh, un, un, uh, impure uh, or, or clean rather. And so the Old Testament had uh, rules about washings. It did, but it was for the priests. The priests had rules for washing because they handled the sacrifices, because they were in you know, either the tabernacle or the temple. So there were rules for the priests, okay? But there were no rules uh, for the people. Uh, the Pharisees had invented these uh, rules. Uh, they were all man-made rules. That's why they say descended from the elders. They meant you know, past generation of scribes and Pharisees you know, handed down from one generation to another, added on. And a lot of the teaching in those days was debate over these rules. Rabbi so-and-so teaches this about the hand-washing rule. Well, yeah, well, Rabbi so-and-so over here, he teaches this about, you know, this is what the teaching was. All right. So uh, we go to verse 5. It says, the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? So they challenged Jesus by accusing him of setting aside the rules and traditions established over the years. Remember, they're not accusing him of disobeying the word. They're accusing him of uh, uh, not following the tradition of the elders, man-made things. So in verses six to eight, Jesus comes back at them. Without an explanation, there's no, what's, what's amazing here is there's no explanation. Like what I've just explained to you, and probably many of you knew already, but anyways, what I explained to you about the washing and the tradition and different, Jesus doesn't even bother doing that. He goes straight you know, on offense mode. And he said to them, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men, meaning the doctrines of God. They're saying they're, they're teaching their teachings as if they came from God. That's what he's saying there. Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. So Jesus accuses them of being Hypocrites, right out of the box. This word uh, is only used in the Gospels in this way. It means especially a religious hypocrite. And it refers to an actor under a mask. The hypocrite tries to act before men the way he ought to be before God and yet is not. The worst form of hypocrisy is when you begin to believe the act yourself. They actually believed that they were doing uh, God's will. Jesus quotes Isaiah 29 verse 13 to describe two kinds of hypocrisy. One, you honor God only with your lips, but not with your actions. In other words, you're all talk. You're all talk. You don't walk the walk, you just talk. And two, Teachings that are invented by men, but are presented as being from God. Those are the two types of hypocrisy that he accuses them of. And nothing new, it, it continues today. How, how many places do we see people teaching, uh, teachings of men as if they come from God? I, I, won't, I won't get into that, but we see that uh, today as well. And so he continues, he was also saying to them, you are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and he who speaks evil of father and mother is to be uh, put to death. 
But you say, if a man says to his father or his mother, whatever I have that would help you is korban, that is to say given to God, you no longer permit them to do anything for his father or his mother, thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many things such as that. So he gets into the, you know, the nitty gritty, as they say. He gets granular. He gets down to an actual thing that they do, which is hypocritical. After denouncing them as hypocrites for saying and not doing and teaching human doctrines as coming from God, he gives them an actual example of this type of hypocrisy as practiced by the Pharisees. He even, he even adds one more condemnation saying that the only way they succeed in their imposing of human traditions is by first removing the law of God to make matters, to make matters worse. In other words, they don't only teach men's laws, they remove God's laws in order to do that. And so the example he gives has to do with the responsibility of honoring one's parents, thus caring for them. The fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother, right? Not only honoring them, but honoring them in the sense of caring for them when they are older and they need, they need your help. Their responsibility by God's command was to honor and care for their parents. That was the real thing. That was the real command. Okay? So they created a rule that said, if you pledged your money to God, that's Korban, if you pledged your money to God, then you couldn't use it for anything else. It was like putting your money in trust. Okay? It doesn't mean they actually gave the money to God. You know, it's not like they took the money and brought it to the temple and put it in the box or gave it to the priests or something like that. It's not that they gave the money. They simply uh, deemed it. They put it in trust. This is in trust for God one of these days. One of these days, this money I've set aside, I'm going to use it for God. Not now. Right now, I'll just hang on to it, but it's, it's set aside. So sorry, mom and dad, you know, I, I can't help you. That was, that was, that's what was happening. And, and Jesus calls them on it. So it doesn't mean, excuse me, it, it, like a living trust or a trust fund, right? In this way, they kept the money. They didn't help their parents. But they felt good because in doing so, they convinced themselves that they were loving God and honoring him in this way. Well, what do you mean what's wrong? I didn't do anything wrong. I got this money aside. It's for God. I, uh, you know, I don't know how I'm going to give it yet, you know, but it's in trust for God. Corban wasn't a bad thing. You could make a pledge you know, to leave money in your will, to donate the money to the temple. That was all a good thing but not when it outweighed the more important need of caring for your parents. You know, the hierarchy of needs. If you've only got so much money, you know, left over and, 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 and your, your, your mother needs medication and can't afford it, uh, what are you going to do? You're going to put, it's the money you've set aside to give to the Lord on Sunday. I, I don't want to put a dilemma in your mind, but it's the money you've set aside. You've set aside a hundred bucks, let's just say. You know, to, on Sunday when the plate comes around, you're going to put that hundred bucks in there and you just leave it in the cupboard there. It's a hundred dollar bill. You know, I'm going to, that's, you know, I've put it aside. And your mother needs it. What are you going to do? You're going to put it in the plate or you're going to help your mother? Simple as that. What trumps what? You know, the teaching in the Bible tells us that we give according to what we've been prospered, right? But there's also a command that says that we ought to honor our parents. Which is the, which is the higher one? What would you do? No comments? I can't hear you. Oh, yeah, you'd say that, sure. <laughs> she, she still cooks for you. Yeah, go ahead, Marty. At that point, at that point, 
was to do good to the saints. There was a need, and so they were making a collection to give to the saints. So it's, it's the same thing. It would be uh, totally backwards to say, well, I've, I've got to keep this for the collection, do good to the saints, so I can't do good for my mom. Right. right. That's, that's totally backwards. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Not that new shotgun, I might be able to do both. <laughs> <laughs> it was used. <laughs> my point is that the same types of dilemmas appear today. You know, we, we face those kind of dilemmas today as well. You know, it's one thing to say, well, ah, look at those Pharisees, boy, those guys were no good. But I mean, we, we just as easily face those uh, dilemmas, uh, uh, those dilemmas today. So we keep going, verses 14 to 23, I'm not going to read that, but uh, what's going on is that Jesus gives another example of this inconsistency by responding to the earlier accusation concerning, you know, the washing and the defilement. He, uh, he explains that food does not have the power to make one pure or impure. Morality has to do with a person's heart, not food. Food is consumed and voided. It has no moral effect in and of itself. It's amoral. Food is amoral. Washing before eating did not increase or decrease one's standing with God from a moral perspective. Morality, impurity, was not like bacteria that could be transmitted by touch or by contact. In saying this, Jesus deems all foods clean. In other words, there is not a moral value in eating or not eating. And uh, the Pharisees had made, uh, you know, a cottage industry uh, out of determining what you could do, what you couldn't do, what you could eat, what you couldn't eat, how you could eat it, when you could eat it, what you had to do before you ate it. His, uh, he also uh, clarifies that the things that come, uh, that cause impurity rather, are those things produced by the heart, spoken by the lips and carried out by the hands. What you think, what you say, what you do, those are the things that make you impure in God's eyes, not what you eat. So once again, Jesus shows that substituting man's word for God's word or rule is hypocritical and it's dangerous. Hypocritical because we believe our traditions are more important and effective than God's laws. Dangerous because we love the power to change and affect our lives when we exchange the simple word for just traditions. We lose sight of what's important. We, we focus on the rules and the keeping of the rules instead of focusing on God's word and his laws. And of course, we, we lose salvation because Jesus tells us that only those who do the word of God will enter into the kingdom. Now, he had made a mortal enemy now of, of the Pharisees because he has not only answered them, but he's denounced them and he's exposed them as hypocrites publicly. That was not a good thing to do. Uh, they were not a, a good enemy to have. And now, you know, the game has changed. Now, before they just came to question him, you know, who are you? Who gives you the right to say this and that? Now it's, oh, we're hypocrites. You're turning the people against us. Okay, we're going to show you what, what, what happens to people who do that, and we see that as the, as the time goes on. So we get into another episode here, the Syrophoenician woman in chapter seven. Jesus has earned the wrath of the religious leaders by exposing them through his teachings. Now he will earn their undying opposition by performing a miracle on behalf of the ones that they had originally complained about. Remember he said, you have to become you know, pure, uh, in case you touch something that a Gentile touched? Following that debate, what does he do? He goes and heals a Gentile. <laughs> I mean, if it wasn't bad before, now it's really getting bad. And so they argued that you could defile yourself simply by touching something that a Gentile touched. Jesus now is going to do a miracle that will heal a Gentile, and this, in their eyes, would be a major breach of their laws. It wasn't a breach of God's laws because the Jews were supposed to be a light and a blessing to the Gentiles. And Jesus was doing exactly that. 
However, the Pharisees had so many rules to avoid falling into idolatry of the Gentiles, they completely cut off any opportunity of winning them over. Again, something that happens today. We as Christians become so insulated in our own bubble that we hardly ever come in contact with someone who's not a believer. You know, all our friends are Christians. Most of our activities are church activities where there will be Christians, you know. If you add work on top of that and so on and so forth, you, you don't have a lot of opportunities to interact with those who are not believers. And of course, if you, if you live in Oklahoma, there's so many believers, even though they're not mem members of the Church of Christ, there's so many people who agree that Jesus is the Son of God, you know, you rarely come in contact with somebody who just doesn't believe in God, period. I, I say to you, you know, I, I was only up there for a couple of days for my sister-in-law's funeral, but I was in Montreal, oh my goodness, <laughs> oh boy, it's like being on another planet, you know. I, I met plenty of people there who don't believe in God, in my own family, yeah, never mind. I didn't have to go meet any strangers on the street. You know, they were right there at the funeral. Uh, no funeral, no funeral, you know. No prayers, no talk of God. I didn't hear you, I did not hear the word God, not one time, not one time. And they buried not one, but two of Lisa's sisters on the same day. No talk of God among the people there, among anyone at all, not, not a mention of it. And that's what I'm saying is it's very rare for us who live here. So in verse 24, it says, Jesus got up and went away from there to the region of Tyre. And when he had entered a house, he wanted no one to know of it, yet he could not escape notice. So he leaves Capernaum and he goes to the extreme border of the country to avoid the crowds and of course to avoid his enemies. But after hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of the Syrophoenician race and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her uh, daughter. Uh, the woman was a Gentile, a pagan, but she believed in Jesus' power. Note how her approach is different than that of the Jewish leaders in verse 27 and 8. And he was saying to her, let the children be satisfied first, for it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered and said to him, yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table feed on the children's, on the children's crumbs. And so Jesus responds to her request uh, by describing his primary mission. And his primary mission is to feed the children, meaning God's chosen people, the Israelites, they're the children, to preach the good news to the Jews first. Why? Because that was what the word of God said. That's why he was following the word of God, preaching to the Jews first. Now dogs, you need to understand something about dogs. Dogs uh, in the culture of those days were wild dogs and they survived the scavengers. Few people owned them and uh, they, were not, they were not actually welcome. Some families, perhaps a little wealthier families, kept them as pets, but this was exceptional and they were, uh, they were just fed scraps off the table. You know, there were no special food. You know, now they have food and supplements, excuse me. You know, put the food down, you know, buy this $80 bag of supplements. It's not really food. You just put it on there and they get their pro probiotics. They get all their stuff, you know, fine, it's okay. Uh, but uh, in those days, you know, uh, it, w it was like the 1940s and 50s. If any of you remember the 1940s and 50s, you know, you ate and then you went to the dog's bowl and you went, Psh! and what you didn't eat, the dog ate. Now, I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm just saying that's the way it was. You know, the dogs ate the scraps. And Jesus is uh, basically uh, saying, this, uh, saying this truth to her. Now, he uses the word for pets in this passage, 
And he's saying, let the children eat first as is proper because it wouldn't be right to feed the pets with their food. Well, yeah, would you, well, if we were back in the 50s, now in the 40s, you know, would you make supper and then take the portion that you were going to feed your child and go to the dog's bowl first and, you know, scrape away some of your child's food into the dog's bowl before the child ate? Well, of course not. You wouldn't do that, right? Well, that's what he's saying here. You, you wouldn't feed your dog first. You know, first the children have to eat, and then, the, you know, the rest goes to the, to the dog. So she understands that righteousness must be fulfilled. She gets it. First things first, she says. But when they're done... Can the pets have the leftovers? She understood her position in the community and asked only for a small portion. And in doing this, she showed not only her faith, but she showed her humility at the same time. And then he said to her, because of this answer, go. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And going back to her home, she found the child lying on the bed, the demon having left her. So Jesus performs a great miracle, this time at a distance, exercising his will, only his will only in casting, uh, no big show. Uh, you know, I was part of a Pentecostal movement before I became a Christian, a uh, New Testament Christian, and we used to do that, cast out demons and all that kind of stuff, you know, and uh, laying hands on people. Oh, it's like, oh, 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 oh. You know, there's a lot of that stuff going on. Uh, and and, and there, always, there had to be contact, you know. You had a contact and you had to do stuff and you had to jump up and down. And it was basically that that eventually turned me off. Why? Because I kept reading the New Testament. <laughs> I just kept reading the New Testament over and over and over again. And I didn't see in the New Testament anything that was going on in that church. And when I confronted the lead pastor about this, not in a, not in a uh, insulting way, just where do you get all of this stuff here? Where do you get that from here? Show me. I, 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 don't, I don't understand. And he answered me, you know, I said, because I don't think I can stay with this, you know. I can't, I, I can't do this. I can't imagine Jesus doing what you guys are doing. And he said to me the same thing that the priest said to me when I said to him, you know, I, I, can't, I can't do this anymore, Catholicism. I can't do this anymore. You, go, you don't answer my questions. You have no answer for my questions. You keep telling me that they're mysteries and I don't understand. And, you know, uh, I don't have to understand. And I would say to him back, but I do have to understand, you know. And when I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm going go, to go look for something else. And he said to me, the priest said to me, he said, you'll never make it without us. Okay. Those are the exact words that the pastor of the Pentecostal group said to me. You'll never make it without us. So I kind of knew I was on the right track, you know. <laughs> I kind of knew I was on the right track. So Jesus deals with the, doom, uh, the demons and related problems uh, 80 times in the Gospels. It's a, um, it was a problem in those days. You know, today we say cancer is a big problem, kills a lot of most people, you know, heart, heart disease kills a lot of people. In those days, demon possession was a problem. 80 times in the New Testament, Jesus deals with demons, possession, and so on and so forth. Another example of Jesus dealing with this common problem of that era um, demons never manifest themselves as monsters like they do in the movies, in the Bible, or persons outside of people they possess. Their presence is only known because of the suffering that they cause in the individual. That's how they're known in the Bible. All this other stuff that you see has all been created by Hollywood. Then there's the deaf and dumb man in chapter 7. Again, no time to read all of it. Jesus returns to the area where, he, where the demoniac had lived. 
And this time, the crowds are eager to see him. Remember when he, he sent the demons into the pigs and the pigs ran down and the people said, go away, we don't want you here. Uh, and he sent the demoniac back to the, um, the, the ten city region, Decapolis, the ten city region. Go tell him, you know, what happened to you. And he goes back and he apparently, uh, he, he, he does what Jesus says because when Jesus returns, the crowds are there. So he says again, when he went out from the region of Tyre and came through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee within the region of Decapolis, that's where the demon possessed man lived, they brought to him one who was deaf and spoke with difficulty and they implored him to lay his hand on him. So now, you know, they're on board now. Now they, they want him to do that. And they tell Jesus to lay his hands uh, on the man to heal him. And Jesus does miracles to prove who he is not to put on a show. So we read in verse 33, unusual passage. It says, Jesus took him aside from the crowd by himself and put his fingers in his ears and after spitting, he touched his tongue with the saliva and looking up into heaven uh, with a deep sigh, he said to him, uh, effat, uh, uh, excuse me, effafata, uh, that is uh, be opened. And his ears were open and the impediment of his tongue was removed and he began speaking plainly. And he gave them orders not to tell anyone, but the more he ordered them, the more widely they continued to proclaim it. So the man, the deaf and dumb man is confused. He's facing this strange rabbi, doesn't know who he is. And so Jesus takes him aside so they can, you know, they can be alone. Jesus needs to communicate to the man what he is about to do. I mean, how do you communicate to a deaf and dumb man that you're about to heal him? Well, you use sign language that he can understand. The fingers on the ears to signal the problem here is recognized, I know you're deaf. He spits and touches the tongue, signifies the same thing, I know you can't speak. A sigh and a look towards heaven to show where the solution is coming from, a way to communicate that the man's own prayers, his sign, has been heard by God and is about to be answered. He looks at him and says, be opened. And the fact that the man hears and responds is a sign that the miracle has taken place. Imagine, how does he, how does he heal the deaf man? He speaks to him, <laughs> assuming that the deaf man is going to hear him. Be open. Oh, and he hears, be opened. And so his tongue is loosened, his ears are open, and a great miracle takes place. Verse 37, it says, they were utterly astonished, saying, he has done all things well. He makes even the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Once again, Mark comments that the reaction of the people demonstrates that they were convinced that there was, uh, these were legitimate, uh, legitimate miracles. Keep going here, because it's just a series of miracles. The feeding of the 4,000, chapter 8, verses 1 to 21. This is the second time Jesus performs this type of miracle, contrary to some commentaries who say, well, you know, there's, there could be a mix-up, you know, they're just talking about the same thing twice. No. Mark would not have repeat the same event twice in his own gospel, especially at the pace that he's going. You know, one miracle after another. He's not going to repeat one miracle that he's already talked about. So this is a different time. It's similar in situation and outcome, but the people and the location are different. This miracle actually sets the stage for teaching that Jesus will give his disciples after they leave this place. He warns them about the Pharisees, you know, the leaven of the Pharisees and their teachings and treachery. Now that he has received their wrath, by exposing and condemning them publicly. He knows he's in trouble. So he warns his apostles, you know, beware the, the leaven of the, the Pharisees. So uh, he does this using a figure of speech, comparing their evil to the leaven hidden in dough. Of course, the apostles uh, never miss a chance to misunderstand. And so they misunderstand thinking that he's chastising them for forgetting to bring along some of the leftover bread from the miracles. They had baskets and baskets full of bread left over from the miracle and they forgot it. Well, they had to eat something. 
There was food that could, you know, they could have taken care of them for, you know, several weeks. They left it behind. So they think, oh, oh, we're in trouble. He's talking about the, uh, the bread. He then chastises them for not for not for forgetting the bread, which was true enough, but for failing to understand what was going on, failing to recognize who he was after seeing so many, so many miracles and teaching. The irony is the people are saying, wow, miracles. Who is this? He's somebody special. But the apostles that he traveled with, they're still scratching their heads, you know, thinking, well, what's going on? What's happening here? Another miracle, uh, this time in chapter 8, 22 and 23, uh, curing a blind man. Same idea here. Is that the first bell? That's the second bell. Okay, so we're done. Uh, I'll just keep on going next week. I'll try not to have this squeak in my voice. I'll oil that down. All right, thank you very much. We keep going with Mark, and I, I've mentioned it before, some went uh, to seek out Marty's class, and Marty and I had agreed together that um, uh, I would do Mark, there are nine lessons, my mistake, nine lessons, I would do my nine lessons in Mark in here, and then he would pick up afterwards, just replace me, and keep going in an auditorium class with his class after. We felt that would be more convenient instead of splitting everybody up. So... Uh, be patient, uh, his class will, uh, will uh, begin in a couple of weeks after we're finished with Mark. All right, we are dismissed. Thank you for your attention.